Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to continue looking at uh, Daniel 11, verse 23 and 24. There definitely is a lot of things that we have to do, understand about these, these, these verses. And um, I don't know if I'm any further in my understanding, but uh, if we invite the Holy Spirit, um, I'm sure the Holy Spirit can lead us and give us wisdom. So let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. A dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful all the things you do in our lives. And we ask, Lord, that we can uh, come close to you this morning and to each other, that your Holy Spirit can unite our hearts in Christian love. And uh, we just pray, Lord, for your presence um, in this study. Help us to understand the words of Scripture, to share them with others. And uh, we pray, Lord, that the things that we learn can teach us more and more uh, to depend upon you and to trust in your providences. And we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. So um, I've been looking and thinking. I don't know that my looking and thinking has, has helped much, but uh, I'm just going to do a quick review just to kind of bring our focus back on what it is we're trying to do here with Daniel chapter 11. So one of the things that I think is um, amazing, so I'm going to use that word, uh, of what we have discovered that is very different from anything I've ever seen in Daniel chapter 11 is this connection to Daniel chapter 10, where we start to see Basically, it's going to be pal, um, Palmoni, or you, even if we want to take um, uh, this, um, you know, we have Michael, right? And and the connection between Michael and Palmoni, I think, has to be understood here. That is, what we see is we see that Michael is a name that's given in this this conflict with Satan, right? And there's this battle going on, right? So in here, I'm just going to go to uh, these chapters here. And and maybe I haven't expressed it really well, but if we go back to uh, Daniel chapter eight, right, we're going to have these series of visions. Now, we know chapter eight, chapter nine and chapter uh 10, 11, and 12 are all connected. And what is the connection? What is the connection between these chapters? The outline of world history. Okay. How is it outlined in these chapters? Are they all connected with the vision? Okay. They're connected with the vision. And what is the vision? I mean, we could also include chapter seven in here too, but, but specifically there are things in chapter eight and nine that are going to be addressed in chapter 10 and, and 11, right? So, so it would be that they're, it's these time prophecies, right? They're interconnectedness. So there is a question that's asked in chapter 8. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of des- desolation, right? So here we have a question that's being asked. And this question is is integral to understanding what's what's being um, addressed, what 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 Daniel is personally struggling with here, right? So Daniel's going to be struggling with this understanding. Now we know that we have uh, in Daniel eight seventeen, right? We have this vision here that's going to be talked about, Chazon, right? But we also have uh, the Mara, Mare, whatever it's called. I don't know, pronunciation. Um, so you have the Chazon, and you're going to have um, the vision of the evenings and mornings. 
So the vision of the evenings and mornings, that's going to be Mara. Mara, I don't know. Right, 4758. Uh, we're going to see in chapter 10, where it's going to talk about, now there's another thing called the matter, but uh, we'll, we'll come to that. Um, it's going to say in chapter 10, verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. So the vision is the 2300 days. And what is the thing or the matter, the debar? What is that? Not the chazon? No, it's not the chazon. Because think about the, the, the word debar, which is sometimes translated the word. So where is that being referred to previously? Well, it says that the debar was long. And so if you go back to... When it talks about the Chazon, it was like many days. But so there's a connection, the there's a connection there with long. The vision okay. Being long. okay, but the thing that's long is the time appointed. That's the Moed. The thing itself is referred to in chapter 9. So when you go to chapter 9 of Daniel, uh, let me see here. That's going to be uh, just man, that word. It's, this is such a common word. Anyway, it's going to be referring back to uh, the 70 weeks, right? That's what it's going to be referring to. So why is this? It's the word commandment. Know, therefore, and understand from the going forth of the commandment, that is the debar, right? To restore and build Jerusalem. So what it's saying in chapter 10, because that's just going to follow in chapter 9, he understood the debar. That is, he understood the commandment and had understanding of the 2300 days. So the time appointed was long. So, so what are you saying about this, Stephen? Because, because I know I interrupted you. Yeah. So the uh, Charles one was for many days. Right. So we have that connection with being long. Right. So the chazon is going to be connected with the time appointed. That that's so, so there's basically three different visions that are being addressed here. Uh, the time appointed. And he also is going to know that the thing was true. Right. So the thing is the commandment was true. That is the debar, the, 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 the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Right. And that the time appointed was long. So this time appointed. Now. You could say that the time appointed also refers to the 2300 days. So, so it could be the thing was true, the commandment, and the time appointed could refer to the 2300 days because it's a moed and it ends with the feast. But so does the 2520 end with the 10th day of the seventh month in 1844, right? Both of those prophecies end on the same date because they're both connected to the 10th day of the seventh month because they're connected to the seven times, right? So so I think primarily the 2520 ending in 1844 on the 10th day of the seventh month, that is primarily uh, the result of the seven times. That the 2300 days also ends there is because God intentionally wanted it to end there because it's going to deal with the cleansing of the sanctuary. So one deals with the Jubilee, the other deals with the cleansing of the sanctuary. Um, and then the thing is the commandment um, that and that connection between the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem and the understanding of the 2300 days that they have the same starting point. What I'm saying is in Daniel 10, verse one, Daniel understands both these things. Right. So he now understands the prophetic periods. Right. Because that's what the angel was giving him this knowledge of. So what Daniel is looking for in chapter 10 is for um, the commandment to actually be issued. Right. That is the first commandment, the one with Cyrus, because he knows that um, that Cyrus is going has to issue a command for that for that prophecy to be fulfilled regarding 
uh, the end of the 70 years, right? Because at the end of the 70 years, God is going to visit them and show his good word toward them and causing them to return to this place, right? And so that's what Daniel was looking for. So that's why Daniel is fasting, right? And praying. It's not a complete fast, but I don't think it is. But he, but he's praying and fasting. And then on the 24th day of the first month, he's going to give this message that basically the commandment has now occurred. That is Cyrus's commandment. So he has the first of the decrees that are put into place. And, and then he's going to be told about this conflict between Christ and Satan, right? Christ here is going to be described as Michael. In chapter 8, he's described as Palmoni, right? The wonderful number. But it's the same person, right? It's Christ. So when we get to chapter 11 and we start to read through this, um, uh, this prophecy, right? So he's going to say what's going to happen. First, you're going to have these different kings of Persia, right? And then it's going to move to the kingdom of Greece, and, and we're going to have some things that are interesting, like the phrase, the end of the years. So, so these are, are things that uh, refer to time. And so we'd have to understand that there's time elements in these prophecies. Um, and then, um, we're going to see this providence of God, uh, working because there's going to be, um, in verse 14, and in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south, and also the breakers of thy people or the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. And and so this would be in God's providence. That is, it wouldn't be the motivation of Rome to exalt themselves to establish God's vision. This is obviously God's providence elite allows them to do this, right? This has to occur. Uh, but they shall fall. Right, referring to their ultimate end. And then we're going to have um, this idea, and he shall give him the daughter of women. And we discussed that in 1117 um, in detail. And, and my view, whether everyone accepts it or not, is that this is in God's providence, that this, this becomes a symbol. And so we discussed whether this was the father or whether who it was that gave uh, to Julius Caesar, his daughter of women. But the fact is called a daughter of women is, is just kind of a strange expression. Um, and so, uh, so we look at the, that this is again something that's in God's providence that's being referred to. And, and then we're going to have, um, in verse 18, uh, we're going to have this expression where it says, uh, for his own behalf, a, a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease without his own reproach. He shall cause it to turn upon him. This is not a very good translation of what's there in the Hebrew. Um, so one is it says it just literally says a, a prince shall cause to cease the reproach. Nothing about for his own behalf. Right. And, or offered by him. Right. None of this. So so they put things in there. Uh, that were because of how they understood the history. So they're, they're, they're translating this to fit their idea of what this is referring to. Um, but if we understand that this is referring to Christ, it makes perfect sense. And the question then is, why would this now uh, be here? Why would we have this reference to Christ? Well, because what we're going to have is uh, the death of Julius Caesar, um, the rising up of Caesar Augustus, and then uh, followed by Tiberius Caesar. So, so the idea is that this is now introduced because of the context of what's going to happen. Julius Caesar is going to die, and in the time of Augustus, Christ is going to be born, and then in the time of Tiberius, Christ is going to be crucified. So this is a very unique way of looking at these passages. And, and people would have to decide for themselves whether this is a correct way of understanding these passages or not. I have a question. Uh, yeah. So uh, Jeff, when he, when he talks about Daniel chapter 8, 
-hmm. He mentions Mikdash and Kodesh related to the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And his argument was, well, if they were going to apply to God's sanctuary, why would he use Mikdash? And then we know that Kodesh does apply to God's sanctuary, so why would he confuse them? To, so obviously he's saying that the Mikdash then applies to the pagan sanctuary. Okay? So taking that sort of line of thinking, mm -hmm. when we have Prince being mentioned in Daniel chapter 11, verse 18, and being yeah. mentioned again in verse 22, we see that the word prince is different. Yeah. So if, if the prince of 22 was referring to Christ, which we believe, understand it is, mm -hmm. why would he use another word prince in verse 18 if it was not, uh, if it was also meant to be referring to Christ? Okay, so first off, we're looking at how it's translated into English and how it's understood, right? So, so we have one word prince but we have two different Hebrew words, correct? Yes. Okay. So so the first word, prince, while it can be translated prince, um, but this is more a magistrate, right? That is somebody who is, who is making, like deciding, right? So it can be a leader or other leader, a captain, a guide, a prince, a ruler, right? Okay. And then... Um, in uh, in the Prince of the Covenant here, uh, this is referring to the covenant, right? So it's 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 in the context of the covenant, correct? Yes. Okay. So so the thing is, it's talking about two different aspects of Christ's leadership, right? So the Prince of the Covenant here, uh, Nagid. Um, so this would be, a, you know, a commander. Uh, military or religious, uh, generally uh, abstract in the plural, honorable, right? Captain, chief, excellent thing, governor, leader. So it is a different meaning. Now, so I understand what you're saying. I, I actually don't think that, um, uh, you know, I mean, obviously we know the, the word mikdash can refer to either a pagan sanctuary or, or God's sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary. Never applies though to the heavenly sanctuary, right? Okay. Right. So Kodesh, or it, you know, refers to, you know, only it, it could refer to the earthly sanctuary as well, right? So you have Mikdash, which which really is just a word that means the whole sanctuary, but it could refer to a pagan or a Jewish sanctuary. So Mikdash does not have like a particular meaning, but it's never used in reference to the heavenly sanctuary, which I think is the argument he's making in uh, Daniel chapter eight. At least that's the argument that he should be making because the heavenly sanctuary, we find nowhere that it's it's referred to as a Mikdash, but it is referred to as the Kodesh, right? They're, they're related words, right? Obviously you can see that one just has a mem at the beginning, okay? So, so those are actually related words. These ones are not. And, and so you couldn't really make that argument from here. I mean, he's, he's also going to have a different reference in, in chapter 10 as well. So he's going to use different words, but this is just showing the different roles or functions related to the verses themselves. Right. And, and if you think about here, uh, a prince for his own behalf, um, in the idea of a magistrate or a judge, well, this is the judge taking, uh, causing the reproach to cease by taking it upon himself, right? So it's relating to his role as our high priest, where in uh, verse 22, it's talking about his role in, in being the sacrifice for sins, right? In dealing with the covenant. Right? He's going to be crucified in the midst of the week. The other thing here, then, is we can see how all of that, what we're looking at here in chapter 11, is relating thematically back to the ideas in chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10. That 
that these aren't just like this other set of prophecy that we're just looking at world history. We're looking at how God is working in this world history and the role, because the only reason any of this is given is because Christ is, is interacting in this history as our savior, right? So this is showing this work of the cleansing of the sanctuary, the offering of the sacrifice. And if you think about what you get in chapter nine, right, which happens just before chapter 10, even though it's this different vision, but you know, it's going to finish off with this whole thing about uh, the pre- pre- people of the prince that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end there shall, uh, thereof shall be with a flood, right? Now here, of course, the people of the prince that shall come, that destroys the city and the sanctuary can't be Christ. Right. This is this is going to be Titus's army destroying the city and the sanctuary. And and we're going to have some of these symbols that we also see in Daniel chapter 11, such as the flood. OK. And and, and some a lot of other similar sort of ver, verbiage. Um, and then he's going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. So once again, you have this covenant being mentioned. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. Um, and now this last part is, is, is kind of obscure, um, for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Nobody can really agree what this exactly is referring to, other than it that has something to do with the destruction of, of the temple again, right? So it's just going to be referring to the destruction of the temple and, 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 and things connected with it. Now, we know that part of the reason why it's it's translated in the way that it is or understood in the way that it is, is, is many people actually um, connect this all with the Tychus Epiphanies, right? There are people who, who say that this has to do with the Tychus Epiphanies, nothing to do with Christ. Um, so I'm not really sure how they do that. I've tried to figure it out. It's like they just take all of these verses and and take them apart and ignore parts of them. But. Does that, that help a little bit, Stephen? Yes, thanks. Okay. So, I mean, I know it's an unusual interpretation of this. Uh, these basically in verse 14 of God entering with his providence is in giving to Caesar, uh, you know, uh, Cleopatra, but, but it's there for a reason that to, to show God interacting with this history. And then, of course, um, oh, pardon me, I guess I got those mixed up. So in verse 14, that's Rome establishing the vision. And then we're going to have this interaction later on in verse. Uh, um, so I got the, let me see, you got to get these verses right. Yeah, so verse 14, and then you're going to have um, in verse 17, he gives him the daughter of women. And then in verse 18, he takes the sins upon himself as our high priest. And then in verse uh, 22, we're going to have the crucifixion of Christ. So, so we can see that there is this intervention within these, these verses uh, that are pointing forward to what's happening in chapter 9 in the final end there. So, so this is an expansion. I guess the main way to look at this is that Daniel chapter 11 is an expansion of the understanding of Daniel chapter 8 and 9. Does that make sense? And if we understand it that way, we can understand why we get to Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. Right here, you're going to have that word sar, which is what we see in a Daniel chapter 10. And, and it's interesting, too, we have this, this word stand standeth which is this word about all of these different kingdoms are standing up right these different kings stand up and these different kingdoms but here at the end michael stands up right and he's going to stand for the children of thy people and then we have this time of troubles that such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time and and there's going to be things that we're going to look at here because one is we have that word time that word that we have understood to be 360, and then it has this word same, 
So there's, there's a bunch of things that we have missed in how we have looked at Daniel chapter 11 and 12. And we haven't really understood the connections. Because if you look at chap, chapter 10, 11, and 12 as an explanation of Daniel 8 and 9, and even Daniel 7. So we, we could take Daniel 7, all of that, say, we have these. Because in Daniel 7, you're going to have the 1260 for um, papalism being referenced. Right? In Daniel 8, you're going to have clearly marked um, the the 2300 days and the fact that it's a part of this 2520. And then the chapter 9, of course, you're going to have the 70 weeks that are a part of the 2300 days and a part of the 2520. But now you're going to have this explanation. And, and that's why when you get to Daniel uh, 12 or 7 and you understand that this time, times, and then half is referring to the period of pagan uh, persecution, that 1260 years from 723 to 538 A.D., it actually makes all of this much more understandable of why there's this 1335 and the 1290. And, and that transition from paganism to papalism, which we're going to get into once we get to uh, Daniel 11, verse 31. So I know that's a lot of things to kind of hold in the mind, right? For somebody who's not really spent a lot of time studying this, they may not see these connections very easily. But but I think that's what, what God is really showing us at the present time, is that there there has been something about the interpretation of Daniel chapter 11 in its in what's been given to us that is generally correct. But what's missing is this connection, this thread that is being woven through Daniel chapter 11. And that thread really helps us to understand and draw the correct conclusions. It, it ends up supporting what this movement had understood regarding Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45. And really from verse 31 to 45. Okay. Any, any thoughts about this? Any observations? Yeah, just uh, concerning so verse 17. Yeah. Um, to me, I'm still favoring the option that uh, that he, that means Caesar, shall set his face to enter with the strength of his whole, in, with the strength of his whole kingdom, and not yeah. right with him. Thus shall he do. So we know this is talking about Caesar uh, going towards Egypt, and he, continuing with Caesar, shall give him. So that would be, yeah, uh, Ptolemy the sixteenth. I think it's like Cleopatra's brother. Uh, give him the daughter of women. So he's going to. He asks what he does. He. Uh, marries or gets Cleopatra married to him, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither be for for him. So she kills her husband, her, her younger brother. To me, that seems to fit that history. It fits that sort of time scale where verse seventeen is talking about. Yeah, so I understand. Is, yeah. So, so the the part of the problem that I had here is when I looked at the Hebrew. So. So for the first thing, um, it, we would agree that this is Julius Caesar and that the upright ones, these are going to be the Jews that join with him, right? I agree. Where we, where we have a problem here is thus shall he do. Well, this is actually a new thought. So when you look at the Hebrew, it it is not connecting this person doing with the previous person. Right. In the King James, it looks like, oh, thus shall he do. But you have to ask the question, why would they even have this? And um, so the idea in the Hebrew, when you look at this, is um, that you're going to have. See here, I don't know if you can see that, but see this Vav at the beginning that 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 is is indicating basically a new clause. And 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 so what this is actually saying when it says thus shall he do 
This, this actually is attached to the giving of the daughter of women, right? It's not attached to the previous clause. Does that make sense? Right, okay. Right? So it shouldn't really be translated in thus shall he do. And so what it's doing is it's inter, inter, um, uh, it's giving us this new he, and he shall give to him. The him has to be the previous him, right? So this he can't be Julius Caesar. It has to be somebody else, right? And the somebody else is the one that's doing, not not Caesar. Does that make sense? Uh, take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that's the way it should be translated, right? Because of that vav there. And, and it wouldn't make sense to end the sentence there because so so he is going to do. So this idea is, um, you know, because we have this, like, he shall do exploits, right? So there's this, this is introduced in different places. I guess we'd have to look at this word, all the places that it shows up and, and see how it, how it fits. But the idea is, and he shall give him the daughter of women, right? So they have the he here twice. But really, it's just part of the same phrase. You wouldn't actually, thus shall he do and he shall give. Because the whole idea is he is he is going to do this. Somebody is going to do something. And the one that's doing it is this he. And what he's going to do is he's going to give to him, to this person that's mentioned before, the daughter of women, corrupting her. But she shall not stand. So we have that word stand that keeps showing up in mud, right? So that's always this, the whole, it's one of these main ideas in this prophecy is, is different people are standing all the time. We're going to see standing, standing, standing. And, and that has to do with uh, taking a position or a place within this prophecy as part of these kingdoms or kings, right? And ultimately, Christ is going to be the one that's going to stand. So, but she's going to stand now on his side. Of course, they've added that, but, um, but she's not going to be for him. And that word be actually has to do with exist. Right. So, so, I, you know, part of the problem is we have this King James being translated into English with, they are already building into their translation what they believe the application is historically, right? Well, do they know that? Do they know the application of that time in the 1600s? Yes. Yeah. This, this are, they is, not, are, they not, are they not connecting it to Antiochus Epiphanes at that time? Yes. Well, that's what I'm saying is they're, they're connecting this to this one here to Antiochus Epiphanes? No. So, because I think that's, that's what the, the Protestants saw generally the whole, uh, the whole chapter basically is revolving around Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, the Antiochus Epiphanes is later, after the time of, of, uh, the translation of the King James. So it is true that the, the translators later in whatever year that was, 17, you know, the ones who did the updated one that have the, uh, the comments, right? The treasury of scripture knowledge. At that time, uh, the Atticus Epiphanes view is going to be, um, predominant, but not at the time the King James was originally uh, uh, translated in 1611. So in 1611, they're not going to have that view. Does that make sense? Okay. So they're looking at that in the time period of, uh, Caesar? Yeah. When they do the original translation. The Bishop's Bible, same thing, right? Because in that time, they're, they're seeing, uh, Rome and pagan Rome and papal Rome, you know, all through this. But in the time of the translators later, whatever year that was, Dwight knows the year, 17 something. So you got 1611, that's the King James. At that time, it would not have been understood as a Tychus Pittens. That idea became more popular later on. And see, the Jews had that view. So the Jews understood a Tychus Epiphanes, but, but the Protestants didn't. 
And you can find this by reading old old theology books. So um, you can just see which views were common at different times. So Tychus Epiphany starts to become a popular view later on in, in the 1800s or 18th century, 1700s. Now, of course, I could be wrong about this, right? I mean, maybe it could refer to that history. Um, but I'm just saying that the idea here is if if we do take that, that this is God's providence being interjected into the situation, it would fit with verse 14. It would also fit with what happens in verse 18, right? So if the idea that this is Christ who's taking the sins upon himself, and then uh, also once we get to verse 22, we know that one's Christ. So so these are definitely possibilities. And, and it does affect how we m- make a present day application of these things. So, you know, so I'm not I'm not trying to, you know, argue against your idea, like saying, well, you know, you're definitely wrong. But I'm just saying that this is a possibility based upon the Hebrew. And that that people have translated this with an idea in mind, right? And definitely, you can see in well, in verse eighteen, it doesn't make any sense in to translate the Hebrew this that we see in the King James. Now, now we'll see that other translations give a very similar uh, interpretation, but a part of that is just because it's a traditional interpretation of this verse. And so they're just they're just going to follow that idea because they also are making an application. Yeah, and like if you look at Young's literal translation, verse 18, and a prince hath caused his reproach of himself to cease. Without his reproach he turned it turneth it back on him. Right? And and you can see that's much closer uh to the Hebrew than the King James is. And, and you can see here, even in verse 17, when he translates, translates it, he puts the word not, and thus shall he do, he, and he hath wrought, right? So, um, uh, now, um, so you can see that, and that just represents the vav. But you can see that this is now a completely different clause than the other one. And then, and the daughter of woman he giveth to him to corrupt her. If you look at the Hebrew here, we actually don't have an and in here, right? So the only and is is here. Uh, oh, pardon me. Yeah, we do. We do have an and there. So at so and he will do, and and this here is what they call the consecutive of. So um, so that's I wouldn't translate it as and. Um, and it has to do with the, the tenses. So it's a little bit technical to explain here. But the idea here is this is a new clause. Uh, because this is this is written in the sense uh, of completed and incomplete. So I'm not going to get into that and how the Hebrew works. Um, so this is going to be all part of this clause right from here. I don't know if that helps. So there's a reason why that you have to put an and in front of that. I forgot about that. But it has to do with the tenses. Because in Hebrew, you have incomplete and, in, and complete tenses. And they, they use a vav to connect those things. Okay. So, okay. Okay. So, yeah, I know some of these things can get really, really technical. Uh, but, you know, Stephen could be right. I could be wrong. You know, he could maybe apply in that way. And the way that you're saying is that Caesar is going to give the him, the daughter of women, the him is. Yeah, I think uh, Ptolemy the 16th. Yeah. So Ptolemy the 16th is going to be given. Is Ptolemy the 16th giving the daughter of women or is Julius Caesar? So Julius Caesar arranges this marriage between Cleopatra and I think it's your younger brother. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, and so that is a possibility, right? And of course, this one is not not essential to our understanding of of what we're seeing. I just saw it as God's intervention here. That thus shall He do that this that this is God doing something 
than rather than somebody else doing something. And so God's going to give him the daughter of women corrupting her. Now, now as far as the corrupting her, um, so that has to do with ruin, right? It's not moral corruption, right? It, it's more about something being destroyed, correct? Right? It's to decay. That is causatively to ruin, literally or figuratively. So in, in the idea of that she's going to be married to her brother, how would that lead to, um, her downfall is, and then also she shall not stand neither before him is what would that be referring to in your interpretation of this? Who would the him be? Uh, well, I'm understanding that she kills her younger brother. Okay. Okay. So how would that make her not stand? And how would she not then exist? Well, I'm thinking more neither before him that in, in the sense that she's, uh, she wants him dead. She kills him. Yeah. So because this idea oh, of being, beings exist, right? So it doesn't mean like to support somebody. It, the idea is that she's not going to continue. She shall not stand, neither shall she continue. That's kind of, that's what it's more talking about. And so, so how are you interpreting it? Well, because the word the the word be, haya, I mean that's where you get from. That's related to the word uh, Yehovah, right? Yahweh. I am that I am. Right, that that's the root of it. To be, I am. Right. So in this case, she's not going to be. This this would refer to her, her her ceasing to exist, or her not continuing. It's not really about being for him. Does that make sense? Okay. Right. So she's not going to stand. And this is always in this context, in this chapter, we keep seeing all of these things stand. King stand, the kings of the north stand, king of the south stands, right? You know, everybody's standing, right? That standing is related to this role in prophecy as a kingdom. So, so this would be referring to the fact that Egypt is not going to become one of these kingdoms. Right. It's not going to become this world kingdom. It's going to end. So this is is pointing to the ultimate end, not just of Cleopatra, but of this kingdom. Okay, so you're saying God is going to give Julius Caesar to Cleopatra. And she's not going to exist. She's going to fall or not stand. So corrupting her, you're saying it's not moral corruption, but yeah, the the, the decay of the southern kingdom, right? Decaying. Yes, right. So this ends up to being the, the destruction because it's not dealing with morality, the corrupting here, right? You know, it, you know, corrupting her, causing her uh, her ruin, is they could have translated it, right? And you know, so uh, thus shall God do. God is going to enter into this situation, giving to Julius Caesar the daughter of women. And, and that's the thing to me that was just this strange expression. Why the daughter of women? I mean, it, it, it's, it's just an odd expression. I mean, you could almost look at it like the son of man, right? And it's sort of this feminine form of this. Um, so the question is why? Why the daughter of women? And this seems to be some kind of marriage, right? The idea is a marriage and going back to, you know, the original marriage thing. But here, this is causing her ruin, right? So the idea that I would have here is that Egypt is not going to rise up as this persecutory power. It's not one of the, the kingdoms after Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and then Egypt, Right. It's going to be Rome. And so Egypt is going to eventually fall to Rome. And and part of that is what ends up happening. And it has symbolic 
uh, reference, um, obviously, because you have a woman representing a church and so forth. And so when we apply it in our time, it's going to give us a different application than if we interpret it um, differently, right? Because in order to understand how we're going to apply things in our time, we need to know what the historical application was. And so we do have these different options here. So I'm not trying to like to dismiss your option. Just trying to show why I, why I did what I did, why I chose this way and, and what the Hebrew actually says. So, so I can see when we just read the King James and we see the word corrupting, well, that's moral corruption, right? You know, but it's not referring to moral corruption. Right? It's referring to basically ruin, decay, you know, so it's, it's a type of ruin uh, that happens through decay. So this, and, and if we look at the history of what happened, ultimately that's how uh, Egypt eventually fell. And now, now we're going to have Cleopatra here. So this is the same Cleopatra that's going to be at the Battle of Actium, right? It's not a different Cleopatra. Because she's going to then be connected to Mark Antony. And so we can see how this, this story leads to her eventual downfall which is directly connected to the downfall of Egypt, right? Right, Stephen? Okay. Okay. So, so, so I think, you know, this, this makes sense. Um, with, with the other interpretation, it's, uh, I mean, it could make sense as well. So I'm not saying that it doesn't make any sense. Um, but we have to sort of interpret what's happening here. Usually what's done is it's, it has to do with, um, not supporting Julius Caesar, but, but I don't think that that's what's being referred to here because this not being is in the sense of ceasing to exist. So, you know, part of it has to do with, I'm just going to look at some of the form of this, see what the way that this is done is, uh, yeah, so it's it's kind of a strange. So this is weird. So they put for him, right? So in the, and that's what I thought. So I'm just checking in my um, scholar's gateway just the form of the word. So they put for him, right there in the King James, but there is no indication of that in the Hebrew, right? So they should really have this in italics. Um, in this phrase, there is no, nothing, nothing masculine. It's simply, she shall not stand, neither be, neither exist. Right? So when they put on his side in italics, they should have also put for him in italics. So the forms of the words here um, are all in the feminine. And there's nothing... Nothing here that would tie this to uh, standing for him. Just looking at all the words here. Yeah, so nothing mass. She shall not stand. That's all feminine. Neither be. That's all feminine. So nothing here that would connect this to her not standing on his side, neither being for him. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So the last time we have any masculine, the corrupting her, that's going to be him is the action is a he corrupting her, right? So when it says he's, she, he shall give him the daughter of women, you know, there you have a masculine action, right? So it's the him that's going to cause her decay. But from then on, everything's just feminine and, and you wouldn't attach any of this masculine stuff to this clause, right? So, so there, there's a problem there, right? In, in just in that interpretation based on how it's, it's, it is in the Hebrew. Obviously, the translation into English gives a different impression. So, that, so that was our, our kind of review so far of what we see, how God is intervening. So we have then, um, as we pointed out, Christ taking the reproach upon himself. And that's, introduced with the death of Julius Caesar, right? So just, so we're going to have uh, 
it's going to mention Christ, then it's going to mention uh, the Julia, Julius Caesar, and then we're going to have Augustus Caesar. And, and the question was, you know, why why would Christ be introduced here? Um, but the prince for his own behalf shall cause reproach. So, uh, so the prince causes the reproach to cease and takes the reproach, turns it upon himself because he doesn't have his own reproach. So, so he has no reproach himself, but he takes the reproach upon him, which would describe Christ. Now, the, we, we asked this question before, but let's just ask it again. Why would, at this point, when Julius Caesar turns his face onto the aisles and sh- takes away many, why is it that Christ Christ is mentioned here before the death of Julius Caesar, right? So this is this is this period of time. Um, now, what does it mean that that Caesar is turning his face onto the aisles? What does he do in this period of time? I mean, we have it over here on on this side. He subdued most of the maritime places and isles of the Mediterranean, but being driven from Europe by the Roman consuls, he took refuge in Antioch. And in order to raise the tribute, they impressed upon him the attempted upon him. He attempted to rob the temple of Elimaeus and was there slain. So I don't know if that makes sense. I'm not sure what they're talking about there. Uh, so that's the translators put that there. So they have a Tychus Epiphanes. That's who they have. So this is this is the later translation, right? So they're going to have a Tychus Epiphanes. The translators, uh, let me see here if we're going to have. So they're going to have a Tychus. Um, yeah. So most of these people are going to have a Tychus Epiphanes. So that's not going to work. And you can see that's much later commentators. So if we go to here, of course, uh, the war in Syria and Asia Minor against uh, Pharnakes, king of the Sumerian Bosphorus, drew Julius Caesar away from Egypt on his arrival to where the enemy was, says Prudhoe. He was he, without giving any respite either to himself or them, immediately fell and gained an absolute victory over them. An account whereof he wrote to his friend in these words, Veni vidi vici, I came, I saw, I overcame. The latter part of this verse is involved in some sense. obscurity, and there's a difference of opinion regarding its application. Some apply it back further back in Caesar's life and think they find a fulfillment in his quarrel with Pompey. Right. So that's part of the problem, too. Um, when we looked at this in the context of Julius Caesar, this didn't really make any sense. Right. So that was part of the problem. How would this this apply? And then he turns his face toward the fort of his own land. That's where he's going to stumble and fall and not be found. So in between here, from turning his face unto the isles and his turning his face unto his own land, we have this parenthetical idea that that cr- the cross is being introduced, that Christ is being introduced. So so the question is, why would it be introduced there? Yeah, I can't think of any reason. Anybody else? Okay, so what is this war? against Pharnakes. So he's going to go to, there's war in Syria and Asia Minor that caused Julius Caesar to go away from Egypt. So what what is this battle about? It's called also the Battle of Zella in 47 BC. Do you, do you know anything about it, anybody? I hadn't considered it because I hadn't been going through this kind of a commentary before. What do you mean? I had not looked at this commentary to look at this battle in relation to this verse. I mean Daniel and Revelation. Your eyes right. missed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean there's a lot of things that I've seen from Smith that just make me shake my head. Okay. So you don't think this has to do with the Battle of Pharnakes? I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So he's going to turn his face towards the Isles and she'll take away many. So you know, Uri Smith puts this to the Battle of Pharnakes. Now, this idea you know, of taking away many, that means to catch, to trap, or in a net, right, or in a pit, generally capture or occupy, also choose by lot. So there's a sort of a figurative meaning. 
Um, uh, so it has some other different meanings. And then you're going to have many, right? So that's just a lot, right? Many, number, multitude, abundance. Okay. So he's going to capture lots of people. Now he turns his face onto the isles, right? So the isles, these are the islands, right? There's, um, we looked at before where uh, the isles first show up. Um, that's going to be, right? I think the first place that we had it is Genesis 10, verse 5. So it's a symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month, right? But these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after the family of the nations, the son of Ham, and Cush, and Mithraim. So this is, um, Mithraim is usually translated as Egypt, right? Here they put it in the actual uh, Hebrew transliteration. So it's going to talk about uh, the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue. Um so you're going to have the different sons of Ham. Okay. That's where we're going to have Isles first mentioned. We also know it's in Isaiah 11, 11. Uh, We looked at that because that's a symbol. Um, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which, will, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And we know that that reference brings us to early writings, page 74, right? The Lord shall set his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people. And she makes an application of it um, after the disappointment, right? But originally this is just a second application, just as they were called out. From Egypt, they're going to be called out from Babylon. That's Isaiah 11, 11. So we have that symbol there. And so we would ha have to take this as significant in understanding um, Daniel chapter 11, um, verse 18. Okay. Any, any more thoughts on this then? How, how would we, because whether it's the Battle of Pharnakes or not, I don't know. But when we look at the symbol attached to the isles, and this this capture, this is a type of captivity. Could we have a reason of why this is placed here if we take into the context of how Rome is acting? So what is Rome doing in this through Julius Caesar? What is what is Rome doing? And why would we then have this reference to Christ, to his cross? Yeah, so. I think Swearing and Janan Smith both apply the prince there to Mark Anthony. Yeah, I know. But we can't do that because it doesn't make any sense in the Hebrew. Because right? the idea in the Hebrew is really straightforward. Uh, a prince will cause to cease the reproach. He has no reproach of his own. So he shall cause the reproach to turn upon himself. And, and that doesn't describe anything in that history of somebody without a reproach. And it, it definitely does. Smith, I mean, Uriah Smith don't mention the prince either, does he? No, uh, Uriah Smith makes this Mark Anthony, I believe. Something to do with, well, what does he do here? Something to do with the quarrel with Pompey. Um, so I'm not really sure I understand what he's talking about. Um, but yeah, so Swearingen, because we've been looking at Swearingen, Right. So what he says, dealing going back to. So thank, thank they find a, refill, a fulfillment in his quarrel with Pompey. Right. Yeah. Something to do with that. But it's talking History. about Caesar. It's talking about Caesar's life. Ain't it? Yeah. Yeah. I understand. But, but I, I just don't think that that makes any sense. And what based on what the Hebrew says. So when it comes to this uh, dealing with um, after this shall he turn his face into unto the isles and shall take away many. Um, so he's dealing with what happens when Julius Caesar is in Egypt, right? And he has Cleopatra. So he turns his face unto the isles and takes take many. Through the pacification of Egypt, he would also eliminate all remaining Pompeian 
and senatorial military forces scattered throughout the Mediterranean basin that had fought against him in the Civil War after his success in the Alexandrian War. Caesar would win military victories at Zella, that's the, the one that's called Pharnakes, that's the battle against Pharnakes, Thapsus and Munda, so that's in 47, 46, and 45, thus removing all opposition to his authority, standing unrivaled as the greatest military commander of his age. Eventually, however, clear Patrick would not stand on his side, neither before him. Right? So I'm interpreting that differently. She would virtu be virtually powerless to stop his untimely assassination on March of 44. Since there's nothing in the Hebrew about not standing on his side or neither being for him, uh, that's just reading into the text something that's not there. And then uh, when it comes to, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered uh, by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then shall he turn his face toward the port of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall. I should show you what I'm reading here. Um, not be found. Because he will be discussed again in our examination of Daniel 11, 25 to 28, this passage introduces a prince for Caesar's own behalf, Mark Antonius, Mark Antony, who would protect Caesar's political interest in Rome while he was away in provincial commands. Serving as a tribune, in 49 BC, Antony had vetoed several legislative proposals designed to weaken Caesar's political ambitions. If Caesar was not president of Rome personally, Antony would often be uh, the target of criticisms named at Caesar during senatorial debates because of his personal loyalty to the famous general. In one specific instance, Caesar was issued a senatorial ultimatum to either disband his troops and return to Rome as a private citizen or be declared an outlaw of the state. Antony promptly vetoed this decree, which then led the Senate to illegally suspend his tribunal power and take legal action against him. He would later flee to Caesar and serve under him in the Civil War. Thus, Antony would cause Caesar's reproach to fall upon himself, similar to the way that Christ would take our reproaches on himself. So it's kind of interesting that they do make this parallel to Christ. But I don't think that that makes sense in the context of well, in what the Hebrew actually says, and um, and this to me is is fairly weak when it comes to this, because because that that's all under, is that, I'm sorry, is that all under verse eighteen? Yeah, yeah, that's where we have him taking the reproach upon himself. Is verse eighteen, right? So, so he notices this parallel with Christ. Um, and my book cuts out a whole lot of that. Yeah, the book I got cuts out all that history. Yeah, but but yeah, well, this is scary again, right? So he says, "But a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach." So this is what the King James says: "But the prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him." Now, that doesn't really make sense. First off, the Hebrew doesn't say almost any of this, right? So there's nothing about a prince for his own behalf. There's nothing about his own behalf shall cause him to reproach. It's just simply, literally in Hebrew, it's to cease a prince um, caused the reproach, like if you put it in order, but it's a prince caused the reproach to cease. That's all it says. And he did not have his own reproach, that is, he was without reproach, and he caused it to turn upon himself. So, um, so this this is where I just have the problem with what the Hebrew says, um, and the idea here is. Uh, Look at the Hebrew again. So this is, um, so to turn, we know that that shuv, and he's going to cause to return uh, the reproach upon himself. And this is reflexive. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, now, the thing about the word reproach in Hebrew is it's, it's, it's a feminine word, right? Re you can, you can see why reproach or shame is, is always feminine, uh, going back to Adam and Eve. 
so so here when you get to the hebrew it's um uh this uh third person manu- masculine singular that is the word to cease so he causes it so the hifel stem is generally used to express a causative action in the act of voice so in many cases the noun derived from the same root is the object is the result of the hifel verb associated with that root for example that doesn't really matter so um so the idea is that that this is causing the reproach to cease so this is is an active form right he he's causing it to cease and then um and then this is going to be this prince right and the idea here of that word prince is um as we noted before um it's going to have to do with like in the sense of determining right as a magistrate as deciding right that's the idea of the hebrew word there for prince it's not a military leader though it can be because they can be involved in deciding battles but the idea is more, more like a magistrate or a judge and and so he's this he's going to cause to cease that is the prince will uh the reproach and and reproach is just in the feminine singular but then he has he has not his own reproach he has not reproach that is there's there's no shame or reproach that he has but he turns it back upon himself so to me this does not really describe uh what we see here in swearing in in mark anthony thing with mark anthony <clears throat> So but but I like the fact that he notices this uh this connection to Christ because I think that's actually how it should be understood. So the reason why I think that this would be placed here is we have Julius Caesar. What is Julius Caesar seeking to do in this history? We're going to have Julius Caesar wanting to be a king. Is that not what his ambitions are? So can we see how we have the opposite that we have in relationship to Julius Caesar's ambitions we have contrasted the character of Christ but this makes sense that that is there for that reason and then when we make the application to our history in contrast to what's happening in this world politics we have the 144,000 as a contrast So then what we see is we see Julius Caesar's ambitions we see Christ's condescension in taking upon himself our reproach and then we see Julius Caesar return to Rome and be assassinated so Julius Caesar has his own reproach come upon him in the sense that you know he has to suffer for his own sins he doesn't accept the cross in that sense right so you see this contrast between caesar and christ any thoughts on that does that make sense to anybody why it's introduced here that we have this contrast between caesar's ambitions and christ christ's character and then it's followed of course by augustus and tiberius so the birth of christ and then the crucifixion of christ in actual history well that offers an explanation for for it being there yeah Now it also brings us back to Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 to 27 right as well um because when we think about these verses i mean there's there's parts of them we always we always talk about um but if we go back there we know that there's going to be these 70 week prophecy right so the 490 years and so we focus on that um but there are some things here that that are important details so we know that that these things are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city right so there's things that are going to happen and we know that that word determined means to be cut off that is a decree to determine right so the 70 weeks we often say it's khatak khatak that's the word khatak okay 
um, is um, it means to be cut off as it's cut off from the 2300 days. That's what you would hear in an evangelistic series. And I'm not sure if that's particularly a good argument or not. I don't think it is, but it is cut off from the 2300 days. Um, so, so we'll just leave that, but it's upon the people and upon the holy city. So we know that ultimately this is leading to the destruction of Jerusalem, right? That is the 70 weeks don't end with the destruction of Jerusalem. They end with the stoning of Stephen, but they are connected to what's going to happen to the destruction of Jerusalem. Because of from the stoning of Stephen in 34 AD to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD is this 36 years, which is is part of a bigger structure. So if the 70 weeks are determined or cut off, they're actually cut off out of all of these other time prophecies. Right. And then the purpose of them is to finish transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity. Bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy. Now, the vision there is going to be the chazon and, and prophecy and anoint the most holy. The word anoint is the word Mashiach. And the most holy, you'll see here that there is two uh, numbers. And that's just because in Hebrew it says uh, Kodesh Kodashim. And, and, and more particularly, if you look at the, the Hebrew, just to, to look at these forms of this word, you're going to see it saying Kodesh Kodeshi, that is holy, holies, right? That's Kodesh just means holy. And, and that can refer to the sanctuary as well. What Stephen was talking about in Daniel chapter eight, you have the word Kodesh. Now Kodesh will never be used in connection with the pagan sanctuary. And Mikdash can always be used in connection either with the pagan or the, the Jerusalem temple, the sanctuary in the wilderness or the temple. But never is Mikdash used in reference to the heavenly sanctuary. So only Kodash is. And the Eam at the end just pluralizes it. So holy, holies. So when we think about this, these verses, um, we can see that in Daniel chapter 11, this is expanded upon. That is Daniel chapter 11 and 12. That there, that there is a connection with the start of the 70 weeks and the events that occur through this history and the end of the 70 weeks and ultimately the destruction of the temple. Right? The city and the sanctuary. That, that there is a process that occurs, right? So first you're going to have this time prophecy and we have the 70th week in which Christ is going to be crucified. Uh, but we also have these 62 weeks, right? And so when you think about it, know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince shall be seven weeks. So we have a, a Jubilee cycle, three score and two weeks. And the street shall be built again in the wall and even in troublous time, referring back to the time of the first seven weeks. Right. So it's, it's not saying what happens in the 62 weeks. And then it's going to go back. And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Right. So, again, you're going to have this idea that Christ isn't going to be taking. He's not dying because of his own sins. He's not being cut off because of his own sins. Right. And the people of the prince, that is Titus, uh, shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So and then he's going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. Right. So it's still talking about these things in Daniel chapter 11, but just in a more stretched out history. So I think it's something that we come back to this tomorrow. I mean, I took a lot more time on this than I wanted, but I think it's really important point in understanding the connection between uh, these different prophecies and Daniel chapter 11. And I, I think to me it becomes like a key in really making a correct application of these verses. Any, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, well, let's pray. <clears throat> A dear, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for all your goodness and love. Be with us 
throughout this day and help us to trust fully in you in all things. Uh, be with us in our personal study and our understanding of your word. And we pray for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.